start with uh, the first question. Uh, can you just tell us about your time in the Navy and, and with the gunslingers? Thanks, Ninja. Um, I uh, received my wings in 1983, and uh, um, I went to the A-7 Corsair II uh, at uh, Cecil Field in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, so I did a tour there uh, on a squadron assigned to USS Nimitz and uh, two MED deployments, uh, one North Atlantic deployment in the North Sea, Norwegian Sea. Uh, from there, I uh, went to shore duty at VFA-106, the, uh, the FA-18 Fleet Replacement Squadron, and I learned to fly the Hornet, and then I stayed there as an instructor, and my specialty was a was landing signal officer. So I went to a carrier qualification phase and, and uh, took classes to the boat day and night, and, and, and during my tour there was qualified to teach in all phases. Uh, after that, I was a CAG LSO on Ike in a, a Persian Gulf deployment, and this is right after Desert Storm in, in late 1991. On the way home, we went uh, up to the Norwegian Sea for uh, a, a teamwork exercise, NATO, and then uh, uh, I flew with a VFA-131 at the time, and then I did my department head tour, another uh, deployment to the Persian Gulf, this time aboard George Washington, did the maiden deployment aboard George Washington, and this is 1994. Uh, for those of you in the UK, uh, George Washington was present for the the, uh, the 50th anniversary of, of D-Day. Uh, we were there in the Solent as the, the, the Queen went by in the Royal Yacht Britannia and then took President Clinton over to Normandy uh, that night. Um, then uh, shore duty uh, with the Air Force and, uh, and then uh, selected for executive officer commanding officer of VFA-105, the gunslingers, and, uh, and all of this flying is at uh, Naval Air Station Cecil Field near Jacksonville, which is no longer in commission. So uh, Enterprise was our ship, Air Wing 3, and uh, did a deployment aboard Enterprise uh, late 1998, early 1999, the Persian Gulf, and a uh, six-month deployment. And uh, back home, we uh, transitioned. I'm sorry, we uh, did a home port change to Naval Air Station Oceana, where the gunslingers are today. So I was the CO as we moved up there. Uh, then War College, and after that, all roads lead to the Pentagon. So uh, two tours there, and, and I retired in 2005. Okay. Um, and... Uh... What was it like being a, a combat pilot, like the the day to day? I mean, we see movies like Top Gun, and it's all like action, and and but um, what was it like realistically being a combat pilot day to day? Um, a a, a mixture of routine and uh, and then a lot of uh, you know intense pre flight preparation work. So a, a lot of my uh, my time was spent in no-fly zone patrol over southern Iraq and Bosnia. I remember when Bosnia was a thing in the 90s, so, uh, you know, lots of time. Uh, and, and we treated that like combat uh, and did not expend any ordnance in my no-fly zone patrols, but were, were ready to, we carried live weapons. And, uh, you know, it was a, uh, an air tasking order, almost always in-flight refueling, even when we were in the Adriatic. I mean, it's just a just, you know, Bosnia is just a, really a few minutes away, but, but we, would, uh, we would top off from a KC-135. And then, you know, patrol is however long we were assigned, and then back to the ship. And sometimes we did that double cycle, that we would, uh, you know, patrol for, I don't know, an hour, and then go back to the KC-135 off the coast of Croatia, top off, and then go back in before we uh, then went home. Um, Operation Desert Fox in 1998, I was aboard Enterprise for that, uh, an intense four nights. And uh, so uh, that was, you know, long range power projection strikes involved lots of airplanes and, and we expended weapons. And uh, we, uh, tanking certainly was, was involved in that. The, um, uh, so, so lots and lots of pre-flight preparation there um, coordination, all the all the contingencies, and and what we briefed is okay. If you're going to do four things, you're going to fly, eat, 
sleep, and plan. You know, you're not going to play Super Mario Brothers, you're not going to work out in the gym, or just, you know, mindlessly waste time. You know, so th those four things, because, you know, we're, we're flying all night long, and, and then, uh, you know, your, your, your body is off, there's circadian rhythms, and uh, so we, we accomplish that. And uh, so you, you have to, uh, you know, you can do that in, in, in short spurts. Uh, the the no-fly zone stuff, while intense, was what uh, was routine, and, and that lasted for, for days and weeks on end before we went for a port visit. Um, so that, that's kind of uh, how we approached it. Okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, man, you were really been all over the world, huh? <laughs> yeah, just an Atlantic fleet sailor. Uh, I was aboard Nimitz when Nimitz went to the West Coast, and we went around the... Uh, the uh, tip of South America, Cape Horn, um, and a little flying in the Pacific Ocean, but uh, virtually my, my whole experience is the Atlantic and the Med and the Persian Gulf. Nice, all right. Um, so we had to ask, do you have any any funny stories that you have from, from your time in uh, the Navy or any particular missions that stand out that you can discuss? Yeah, I, th I thought I thought of this one. I'll, I'll talk about a um, a, uh, a mission that that I led in Desert Fox, nineteen ninety eight, and and we had we had gone up to to uh, to strike a a target, you know, well well inside of Iraq, and and after that we were going to go by a, a secondary target, and we we had a uh, an aim point there, so the, the plan was. Uh, because my wingman's flare uh, was not working, so we were going to buddy laze. And uh, I was going to laze the target, and he would expend his, his weapon, and then his weapon would, would catch my laser beam, and, and, and that's how that works. Um, I gave him the flight lead as we were going to his target. And, and looking back now, that was probably a mistake on my part. But I, I gave him the lead, and I was, I'd, and this is at night, of course, on night vision goggles. And so I, I, I backed away enough. And not, now we're getting kind of close, and we're coordinating, and everything's looking good. And I can, I can see where we're going. Um, and then he, he uh, kind of went from my right side to my left side, and I was surprised because we're, we're pretty close. I mean, we're you know maybe a minute and a half away. And uh, as he is he now he's stabilized, you know, in, in, in front of me on my left, I'd say maybe 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And now we're getting pretty close. And then he starts coming toward me and, and uh, I, I see him and I'm kind of, kind of moving away and he's still coming at me. And I, so I, I bank away from him a little bit and I'm watching on my FLIR, my aim point. And then I, so I, I kind of pull away to the right hard. And as I roll back over, he is right there in my face, still coming at me. So I just pick the airplane up and over. And uh, abort, 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 abort. So you know he aborted, and we uh, and we went back to the ship. Um, we uh, we got back to the ship, and, and of course we talked about it. We debriefed, and uh, his his plan was to uh, to get on a a run in uh, a run in line that, that he thought was was going to be good to uh, to deliver the weapon, and uh, and and didn't. You know, and my job was to avoid him. I mean, I gave him the lead, so I'm the one that has to do the collision avoidance. Um, I, I, I had a wingman with me, and they, they kind of were, were just at the last second. They realized what was happening, and they kind of, you know, gulped before they could say anything. Um, it all worked out, and we, uh, we were able to, uh, to debrief. But mid-air collisions, you know, as you guys fly, and maybe you've experienced that, I mean, that, that was, you know, in my day, that was the, the number one killer of uh, a single seat aviators uh, followed closely by you know, controlled flight into terrain or water you know a perfectly good airplane you get distracted in the cockpit and and uh and, and disaster so uh, uh i'll say this though that going from the a7 to the hornet was wonderful i mean the the a7 was uh, was unforgiving at times uh underpowered you, know, you had one good turn it was a great bomber uh, and and we, we did a lot with it and, and uh, flew lots of low levels, uh, wonderful memories. But the Hornet, is everything is in front of you. 
your your radios and, and navigation. Everything you need is right there. Everything you need is on the throttle and stick. Instead of like the A7, I had to look down to my left console to change your radio frequency and down my right console to do some navigation and weapon stuff. So that was, uh, you know, the, the cockpit design you know, from and really just one generation apart was a was a big story, big uh, uh, game changer for me. Um, uh, you know, where do I start? You know, just uh, the fun times, you know, taking off from Cecil Field, just two of us. And uh, we'd go out over the, the ocean off Jacksonville and, you know, we'd set up for a, a 1v1. You know, and we'd be a beam. You know, speed and angels on the right, speed and angels on the left. Okay, turning in, fights on. And, and uh, you do a, you know, 1v1 engagement. And, and typically, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're always teaching. You know, someone's always a lead and, and an instructor. Uh, so, you know, I'd, I would I would fly with a uh, with a younger pilot, and you know we, we'd come back and talk about what happened. Uh, but I would also fly with with Top Gun trained guys, Top Gun instructors, and and they would debrief me, and and uh, you know to make me better. I mean, I mean in the air, uh, yes, there there is a lead, and there's there's senior. We all know that. But when you come down to it, you know you're you're two to four to to more. You know, as human beings in this formation. And uh, you know that while while a lead is designated, you know we're all just trying to to do the job here. And so you come back and debrief it, and and uh, and, and you're frank with each other, and, uh, and and commanding officers, senior department heads, you know they're they they can be debriefed too. They need to be. And every year we had to earn our qualifications, and it was the lieutenants that would conduct those flights, as I did when I was a lieutenant. And, and had to had to brief you know senior aviators on on whatever it was that we were doing. So it's 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 part of our culture, briefing and debriefing. And, and uh, I, I I imagine that you guys embrace it uh, in your in your virtual squadron. It's a, it's a big part of squadron life. Yeah. Um... To rewind a little bit, uh, we definitely have mid-air collisions in in DCS. Um, I am currently learning how to air-to-air -air refuel, and I've hit the tanker more than once. Um, so uh, that definitely occurs. And uh, yeah, when uh, when we're gearing up to, uh, we try to host a an event or a mission uh, once a month, and usually leading up to that, we have very detailed briefings we go over stuff um if anyone's unfamiliar with how to use a certain weapon system um we try to train them on that over the course of the month so they can be involved in the mission um of course if they're not we don't uh not let them join um because everyone it's a game at the end of the day everyone should have fun but uh yeah but we definitely do do briefings and after the mission we discuss what went on and what could be better in the future and um so yeah that's definitely part of what we do around here i'll uh, tell a funny story you asked for a, a funny one so I'll, I'll tell one on myself of course um I, i'm i'm flying the a7 and this is in the summer of 1985 uh we're in the eastern med flying off nimitz and uh and i'm a tanker pilot so i was qualified to just had been recently qualified to fly the tanker. And so I uh, got the, the D-704 buddy store out there on my left wing. And uh, so uh, F-14 joins up to get fuel and I uh, put the hose out and it just it runs to the end, snaps off, falls off the airplane to the bottom of the med. And uh, okay, what what's going on over there? Um, that night in a different airplane, different buddy store, one of my squatter mates joins up for fuel. He really needs it. Okay, I'm, I'm here for you. You know, I'm just a young pilot. And uh, put the, the hose out, just runs to the end, snaps off, falls to the bottom of the med. Now, I, you know, so two hoses in, in, in one day. Now, when you're a single seat nugget, it's your fault. You know, what did you do? You know, you know how, how fast were you when you, when you extended the hose and, and, and all that? And uh, so I, I knew that that was going to be the reaction on the ship. So I didn't tell the ship, and uh, that was uh, that was a mistake. I got a one-way conversation after I landed, but uh, hoser from that. And and what we found was that the 
that there's a hydraulics um, that that will will uh, will kind of pay the, the the basket the hose out, and you know you're going you know 225 knots. It'll, it'll pay it out into the airstream and not just run to the end and snap off like it did. So the hydraulics was not serviced well enough to to slow that, and and that's what happened. So, but still, hoser. Yeah, that was uh, that was actually going to be my next question. How did you get your call sign? But uh, that kind of seemed to have answered it for us. I hope so. So uh, I want to touch on uh, the the Raven One series uh the the books uh what was your what was your inspiration for raven one um are are any of the characters based on you or i i started writing raven one uh this months after i retired in, in 2005 and and a friend said uh as, as i was retiring you know you should write a book and i, I waved him off i'll, I'll get out and he, but he pressed me on. No, you've got stories, and you know we, we all have stories. And, and, and my career wasn't uh, you know wasn't that dramatic, and it was so many stories. But you know, but I had a few. And of course, I had you know been in naval aviation at that point for over twenty years, and and had had seen things and heard things from others, as that I knew and and maybe didn't know. So I thought, well, yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I'll maybe I'll write a book, which I never dreamed. I mean, I, I looked at, at authors. Oh my gosh, you know, hundred thousand words. How, how can they do that? And well, it, it's one, it's one step in front of the other. Is, is the answer to that? But, um, but I, I approached Raven One as a series of vignettes. And I think if if you've read the book or, or read it now, you can probably see that. Okay, so here's, you know, here's the the, the dramatic night carrier landing sequence with SpongeBob, and and uh, seen plenty of drama to include a barricade at night in my career um the uh and then uh here's a, a close air support over iraq here's a port visit here is a 1v1 training flight that goes really wrong and uh and then with with that stage set and, and of course i'm introducing the reader to to squadron personalities and and sure there's the whole you know the the whole um gamut of people in, in this in this human organization, and 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 most people are really great. And from time to time, you know, you find an outlier that that uh, makes life miserable for everyone. It, it's rare, but it happens. And uh, and then toward the end of Raven One, it it just kind of takes off with all the all the drama of the of the strikes at the end. And and uh, so. When I finished the novel in 2009, because I would I put it away for months and I'd pick it back up, and and then I really sprinted toward the finish, and I, I realized I had something. I, you know, you can tell. Hey, this this isn't bad. And uh, so I, I shopped it around New York. You know, this is if you want to get something published. It's going to be in New York. So first thing you have to find an agent. And so I uh, I queried some agents. And you got to find one that's willing to take a first-time author in this genre, you know, fiction, and, and uh, uh, did not have success. Uh, many said that uh, I, I had some talent and should continue, though, and they encouraged me. They said, it's, look, it's not for me right now, but, but keep trying. And, of course, during this time, Kindle had come out and, and really revolutionized publishing and, and allowed an independent publisher not to have to go through New York and not to have to, you know, uh, submit their rights, lose their rights to their work, to, to a publishing house that can do all kinds of things uh, once you've done that. So um, I think independent uh, writers now are, are respected. Uh, you know, we write books and in, in, in my publishing house, Brave Ship, you know, our motto is we write smart books for smart readers. And we write our own books, and we're not uh, do not have to take any running orders from New York. I use that generic term. That that and New York would certainly shorten Raven One. They would say, you know, cut twenty thousand words. Or which ones? You, you you know, I don't care. I don't care anything really. I just want to sell a book and make money. But you cut a hundred thousand, cut cut twenty thousand words. And uh, so that's that, that's kind of how that works. 
So with the success of Raven One, it was it was published in in the summer of 2014, uh, and I didn't know what would happen. I, I thought, okay, you know, it'll, the kids will have it. It's something. Yeah, I wrote a book, but it just was popular, and people started reading it, and I was I was amazed. And and an Amazon bestseller. Wow. And so there was there was motivation to write again. Declared hostile. Another great. Um, uh, reception there, and then by the time of fight, fight, people are starting to know that that I write novels, and and, and fight, fight, uh, well received. Uh, my last one is a uh, historical fiction novel about the Battle of Midway, and this is the 80th anniversary of Midway, and and here it is, the Silver Waterfall. I imagine many of you have, are aware of it, and uh, and this is historical fiction like Michael Shara wrote about Gettysburg, and and I I did not change any facts about the Battle of Midway. And I did research where I live here in Pensacola, the National Naval Aviation Museum, primary source documents, and, and had, had access to a lot. And uh, so it, it's like the Killer Angels. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's authentic. And I didn't invent characters, didn't invent, you know, stuff that, that, that didn't have to be in the book because what really happened at Midway um, June 4th through 6th, 1942, is just incredible, and, and, and it is stranger than fiction. You know, uh, uh, you know, reviewers wouldn't believe it if, it, it was, if uh, someone had dreamed that up as fiction. So, um, so that, that's how I got into this, um, and I imagine we can talk about uh, how I got into DCS in a moment. Yeah, um, if you want to lead right into that, uh, how... How did you get in contact with, you know, how did Baltic Dragon approach you? And, uh, you know, w was that your first time hearing of DCS or did you know of it beforehand? I got, uh, I, I was seeing reviews about Raven One. And, and, uh, and, and if any of you have submitted a review, thank you so much. And, and you can really help authors by, by doing that. But, but I would see these reviews here. Yeah, this is a great for, for DCS. What, so I kind of okay. What is DCS? So I found out. Okay, this is a this is a a serious video game, and yeah, these guys are flying hornets, and oh, that sounds, sounds pretty cool. Um, so Jello ILO had had uh, invented the fighter pilot podcast, and so I I did not know Jello in the fleet, although we were together at Cecil Field when he was a lieutenant, I was a I was a commander, so we were there, didn't know each other. You know, there's. Uh, at least 10 years of, of separation there. But uh, I saw that he had this fighter pilot podcast because I'm looking for ways to promote and look, look, looking for exposure. So I contacted him. Hey, I've written some novels about carrier aviation. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd like to have you on as a guest. So I was a guest on the fighter pilot podcast. And this is like four years ago, I think episode 20. And uh, so... Uh, so some people had had approached me about DCS and I, just kind of out of the blue, and I, I wasn't sure. I'm, you know, I don't know, um, you know, you know, some foreign entity. And I'm, I'm just not sure. And, and then then Jello contacted me, and you know, he had been approached by some of the same people, and said, "No, this is this is legit." So let, let's meet this guy, Baltic Dragon. So we got on on a Zoom call, and, and I was introduced, and we kind of you know did our our due diligence. I'm thinking, okay, this guy's from Poland, and uh, you know, and uh, Eastern Europe, and and he's he's a he's a Hornet pilot, and and uh, you know, he, he does these games. But what a terrific guy, uh, you know, Baltic Dragon is. And so, um, we we collaborated on uh, on Raven One. Uh, Baltic Dragon scripted Raven One, and he sent the script to Jello and I. And and we would go over it and say, okay, that that's uh, this is not quite right. Here's what would be said here. Okay, this is good, good. Change this, good, good. So that's how that worked, and uh, and and it worked very well. The DCS community reviews on on Raven One are, are quite positive. With Dominant Fury, we said, okay, you know, again, people like this, so let's do this again. With Dominant Fury, we decided, okay, let's. Let's make it a prequel. It, we'll make Flip Wilson, when he just got to the Ravens three years earlier, he's a junior department head. Uh, Cajun will be the XO, and Olive will be a Nugget. So we kind of go back in time. And uh, using the Syria map, uh, Baltic Dragon suggested, 
because he's uh, you know, telling us that it's a very popular map. It's a terrific map because I, I didn't know. And so, so Jello and I spend plenty of time in the Eastern Med. Yeah, okay, we can we can figure that out. So, so Jello and I kind of mapped out uh, how each mission would build on the other. So, just like Raven One, Raven One Dominant Fury is story driven. Each each mission builds on another. It kind of makes sense and to the to the crescendo there at, at the at the finale mission. Um, so so again, Jello and I collaborated. I, I would start and I would kind of build a, a mission, and and would and with all the scripting, send it to Jello. It would do the QA and and we you know we collaborated on that. Had had fun doing it, um, and uh, you know kind of relive old times if you will. And then would send that to Baltic Dragon, who would then tell us, okay, this, you know, DCS can't quite do this. Or DCS can, can even amplify what you're trying to do here, which is great. So, you know, Baltic Dragon is the director. You know, Jello and I did the script. He's the director, obviously, who's going to make this, this movie and, and bring this to life. So that, that, that is how we did that. Um, and now, you know, again, the early reviews are on Dominant Fury or... Are, are positive. We uh, we pushed Baltic Dragon to to the limits of of uh, what can be done with the airplane with supercarrier. Um, the, the Syria map that we that we learned has been recently uh, upgraded to include Cyprus and uh, you know some other some other territory there. Um, we're gonna do this again. Uh, we're gonna make a a, a training a campaign for the Hornet. And it's it's probably going to be in in the Raven One squadron uh, somehow, but uh, we we've identified a, a map for it, and and uh, Jello and I have had some early conversations. We'll probably start working on that um, in earnest later this year. That's uh, that's actually really exciting news. Um... We were. Uh, I was kind of wondering, are, are they going to continue to do this? Is Dominant Fury going to be, be their final one, or uh, are they going to keep doing that? But how cool, that's got to be so cool to, uh, you went from not wanting to write a book or knowing if you could write a book, writing a book, it had success, and now, uh, now it's in a video game. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's... It's uh, quite the distance to travel from not knowing if you could write a book to being in a video game. Um, I think at this time, uh, that was all the questions I had. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the guys who are in here, um, if they have anything to ask, and, uh, and go from there. Uh, yeah, hard, hard good evening. Um, with the with, with the carrier landings, this is one thing I've always been interested in. Because on on DCS, I found myself times with the Hornet where I'm just sort of going sort of three or four, maybe five attempts before I actually catch the hook on the wire sort of thing on the on the carrier. And it's I was wondering how true to life that actually is. Like how how precise you have to get your Hornet within the sort of the angle of attack bars, etc. Sort of thing to stop the hook bouncing, etc. etc. And just have you ever been in a situation where you found yourself sort of circling around and sort of not not managing to to, to catch the wire, etc. Sort of thing. Yes, and and uh, you know I've I've had bolters in my career. You know certainly earlier in my career, my my very first hook down attempt in the training command, I boltered. Um, but then you know you you you, you figure it out, and, and you have to figure it out quick. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, all right, you got a bolter first time. Or you're a junior pilot. It's at night. The deck's moving, and you you boltered. But you know you, you got to go to school and 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 don't bolter again, especially when we're uh, you know blue water ops, you know in the in the Atlantic or wherever we were at the time, Indian Ocean, wherever we were at the time. Um, the uh, the lens, the Fresnel lens, and, and DCS has that display in the in the lower left that I see, and it's 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 obviously two-dimensional i mean it, it, it's hard to uh you know to, to to manage that my um my my thought is that uh make big corrections early so so here's how the lens works each of those cells 
uh, you know, there's a beam of light out into space and you want, want to line up the, the ball with the, the green datums. But each of those cells uh, is, is going to get wider out into space. So for three quarters of a mile, a, a given cell subtends 27 vertical feet. So you have to fly your cell through a 27 foot area to see a center ball. It could be up here or here on the bottom, but you're seeing a center ball out there at three quarters of a mile. As you, as you get in closer to the ship, once you cross the ramp and you're looking at a center ball, you have flown your face through a three foot window. And then as you touch down, that narrows to 18 inches, it's still center ball on glide slope um, and uh, on center line. So, uh, and so, you know, it's easy to say, you know, make, make those big corrections early, but, you know, make those corrections early and, 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 and then recorrect. So, you know, you always lead a high, you're high, so you take some power off, leave the nose alone, you're, you're on speed, hold that amber donut to the best of your ability. Now you're starting to come down before you get there, correct with some power. You're, you're always correcting, recorrecting the whole way down. Um, when you're low, never lead a low. So when you're low, you know, get up to that centered cell, then make the recorrection and a recorrect after that. Um, the use of ATC, I, I would think for a DCS player is a, is, is a good thing. I, I didn't use ATC, uh, my, in the A7 had it. Um, and, uh, you know, toward my second cruise, I, I would use it to set myself up. And then at three quarters of a mile, I would click out and hand fly the rest of the way down. Later in my career with the Hornet and, and the ATC was just a little better. Um, I would fly auto all the way to the deck. And again, I, I had I had more experience in, in the aircraft and, and knew how it handled. Um, uh, at night, uh, I, I would do that. In the daytime, I hand flew the whole way around the pattern. And, and my understanding is that uh, today's aviators uh, in the Super Hornet, they use ATC day and night, and they have this precision landing mode that's in the airplane now that, that they use that I just, I know enough about that to be dangerous. Um, but uh, I, I would think that if you can use ATC and get yourself set up on and on early, and and then you don't you won't have to make big Hayaka corrections. If if you find yourself going high or low, then you got to correct for it, and 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 left or right and, and on speed. So you're working the whole way down. And uh, one last thing, try to declutter your HUD. Um, so you might have a course line display and you're flying the ball, you know, get rid of that. And I would, I would try to get rid of that, you know, outside. Uh, when, once I pushed over and I had needles, I'd get rid of the course line. Um, make, uh, make the HUD as dim as I could stand it, but still be able to read it. And, and now you're, you're, you're looking outside at the, at the ball, but out of the corner of your eye, your peripheral vision, you can see what that velocity vector is doing. And that's where you're going to be going pretty soon. You just kind of file that away and, and correct for it. So that's there's my motherhood on carrier landings. Yeah, no, nice one. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate that. Sure. All right. Uh, anyone else? Pip, Ozzy, Pipman. Uh, I can't think of anything at this time, but I also didn't know about this until about today. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ozzy. No. Hello. This is working. It's working. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, long time listener, first time question. Um, what was the um, what was your scariest time on the boat um, in terms of whether it was weather or conditions or a uh, squadron member coming back with an unserviceability? Yeah, uh, a, a great question. So I I, I will lead by uh, taxiing to the bow. On a black ass night, and that never got easier in, in my career. Uh, and uh, you know, I I knew one you know admiral who I knew who was a carrier aviator. I, I'd known him when he was a squadron CEO. He says, you know, you I make a career decision every time I taxi up there. You know, I I don't have to do this, but of course you do. Now, if you read Fight Fight, uh, a uh, you know a, a, a a sub story, if you will, and in fight fight is is the fear that one aviator has, um, and flying around the ship at night. And and I I can think of a couple of aviators. You know, one one whom I I knew quite well, 
and and he had a, a couple of deployments under his belt and then one night he went to his commanding officer in tears and said i just can't do this anymore i've i've been scared out of my wits my whole career i just can't and and you know my heart goes out to him what, what a courageous thing to do you know all, all, all the all the courage he took over those years to to you know to fly off the ship uh at night and uh uh, on, on, on those black nights, on those black cat shot nights. For me, the cat shot was more unnerving than the landing. And the landing, you know, it can be just as black for the landing. Um, and it's black. It's inside of a basketball black. But uh, you're, you're in control. They've been flying. But with a cat shot, you're just hanging on. And now you've got to go flying. You're 60 feet above the water, and they got to climb away from it. Uh, you know, what could happen? You know, you, you lose an engine on the stroke. You have a total electrical failure on the stroke. And that was probably your, your worst nightmare. Uh, along those lines, I had a gooseneck flashlight, red lens flashlight that I had on my vest. And once, once I hooked up the cat, I would turn that on. And so it would just be on my instrument panel. So if I were to lose everything, I'd still have some light to see the, the peanut gyro and be able to fly away from the water. So that, that's how you approach this stuff. And I learned this, of course, handed down from, from the old guys when I was a nugget and, and passed down these lessons learned. Um, the, uh, so I, I would think that, uh, that night carrier aviation is, uh, you know, just, just gets everyone's attention. The uh, um, birds on a low level, you know, you're, you're having a blast, you're flying over some, some beautiful picturesque, you know, Mediterranean coastal country and, and uh, whoa, and, and, you know, uh, you, you'll see a bird. Typically, when a bird is above you, it sees you too, and it is just as scared. And it tucks its wings in because it's scared; it's going to get hit. And, and it, that means it's just falling right toward you. And you got to you got to get out of the way. Um, uh, power lines, also, you know, you, you get you get surprised by stuff like that. And um, um, my my combat experience uh, was was never uh, afraid. And you see you know, enemy AAA, um, and uh, yeah, there it is. And and uh, I, I think you know just a, maybe one or two radar indications, but but nothing like you know Top Gun the movie where the frog is going off all the time and you know missiles are streaks in the air all the time. Nothing like that. It's uh, um, but I think that uh, the, the the tanker the tanker rendezvous circle and uh, another high mid air collision potential there uh you can you know some guy might not see you and he, he kind of comes in in front of you and it's like whoa hey what's going on and, and uh it's all it's all part of it you know no one wants that to happen and everyone everyone fesses up yeah i'm sorry please forgive me i, I didn't see it I'll, I'll i'll do better next time and, and and that's that's all you need so i i, I hope that was helpful no that's great thank you very much Uh, Pip, you got anything? Um, no, unless you want to go through some of the questions that are on the that we've asked people in the group if they want to, what they want to ask. Yeah, I pretty much uh, ran through those. Um, a couple of them he uh, answered with with some of the other answers he was giving, um, so I didn't have to ask them, but. Uh, uh, one of them here is, uh, what is, uh, one of your favorite memories of flying and, uh, what is one of your worst? Uh, low levels, uh, flying down a Norwegian fjord, you know, above the Arctic circle. Uh, uh, a, uh, a, a sunset landing. You know, you've been flying, had a good flight, and you come back to the ship, and it's you know it's kind of supposed to be night, but the sun is just going down. There's that pink, uh, you know, tinge to the horizon, and, and the ship's heading right for it. And so you, that that's that's nice. The um the the, the times together with with wingman, um you know, flying in formation and doing the, those one v ones or or two v twos that I was talking about before, uh, rolling into a practice target, and uh. You know, and and uh, you know, coming in low level, popping up, uh, rolling in, hitting the hitting the the bomb goes off, 
uh, within seconds of what you planned. Um, uh, bag and traps in the daytime. Uh, you, uh, I was an instructor, and after we qualified our guys, the, the the captain of the ship would let us get in the airplanes, and we just we just go around and get you know trap after trap after trap, and and uh, that that was that was fun. I mean, you know, flying around the carrier in the daytime, you cannot believe you get paid for it. And then of course the sun sets, and <laughs> you you uh you you earn your pay. But, but I, I think uh, what I miss about naval aviation is the challenge and the camaraderie. Uh, what are some of my worst memories? Um, I was aboard Nimitz in 1987, and you may be aware of a of a of a unsuccessful barricade recovery for an EA3 Sky Warrior, the, the whale. And uh, so I was watching that live in the ready room on the plat, and and the and and just in the last seconds, you just knew there was no chance. And 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 I was in the ready room with with half my squadron. You could hear a pin drop. We're all just just you know praying, you know, just watching the plat, and it was unsuccessful. And then we no one made a move. No no one said a word. And now we're watching as the search and rescue is happening you know, right next to the ship. Um, so, you know, to, to see to see loss of life like that real time, and I've seen it wasn't the only time in in, in my career. And uh, so, uh, Raven One ha has that. There's the there's the loss. There's a memorial service, um, and that, that's that's part of it. In my career, uh, well over 20 friends, guys I I'd served with somewhere along the line, uh, lost their lives in, in mishaps. Only only just a one or two to combat. And uh, so you know, it's uh, it, it's part of it. it. It's so much safer now. And it was pretty safe then, when I, when I was in the 80s and 90s, compared to what it was in the 50s and 60s. But uh, but it, it's still there, and I think that that, that loss it, it, uh, will always stay with you. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry about your losses. Uh, that that obviously is something that never leaves you. That that really sucks. <laughs> um. This question is by uh, Mike. He's not with us, but he did post this question. Um, he he asked that previous question as well, but uh, he also wants to know what's one of the hardest things you've ever had to do or learn. Um, air to air, uh, air to air intercepts, and uh, and so I, I mean. You know, in A7s, we, we had uh, an air-to-air -air capability. We carried sidewinders, and we had a gun. And, and so we would we would maneuver, and, and we would, uh, you know, sometimes we'd brief with some F-14s, and we would fight them, two of us against two of them, or, or whatever it was. And uh, um, in the Hornet, though, uh, the air-to-air the, the -air mission was... Uh, was was a real air to air mission, and so you got a, an air to air radar, which we did not have in the A7. It was just air to ground, and uh, so you got an air to air radar, and you got radar missiles, and you've got the, the timeline, and and there's the voice cadence, and and so there's a lot going on, and uh, so that was you know, it, that, that took me a while to learn, and 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 I I was a slow learner, and I knew this about myself. Um, at the same time. The commanding officer, uh, and I was an instructor, supposed to teach this stuff, and so uh, the commanding officer uh, sent me and another instructor to a, uh, a course in, in Key West that was designed just for instructors like us, and so it couldn't have been a better time for me to, to really concentrate me on, on how, to, how to run a, a good intercept in a, with all that you know, timeline, calm required. And then be able to come back and debrief that and teach a student. And and as you know, when, when you teach something, you're going to get good at it. And so uh, um, I I uh, I was able to to not only hit the books, but also learn from those that that were much better than I was and became pretty decent in the uh, in the air to air role. So I think that was that was uh, my biggest challenge. The carrier landing thing. Uh, I was 
I I, I was blessed that that uh, in, in the training command that uh, I I did pretty well, and uh, so I, I got the A7, which was a which was a handful, and and it was a handful for me the, my first year flying it, and then the light bulb went off, and uh, I was able to anticipate what the airplane was going to do and what I had to do to stay ahead of it. The Hornet was just a, a joy around the ship at at all times. The uh, so I, um, and this all I, I think that uh, the uh, the air the air to air piece, and and later in my career the uh, complexity of a precision strike, and and the night vision goggles, all the all the digital uh, wizardry that we had in the airplane and in the weapon that that, that was new. Obviously, uh, learned it though, and, and I had to, just like any lieutenant did, if I was going to uh, contribute. So, uh, yeah, it, learning never ends. It, uh, if, you're, if you're flying in, in an airplane, uh, and I don't care if you're the strike group admiral, you know you're you're gonna you're gonna have to stay on top of the latest. Okay. Um, cynic wanted to know uh did you ever um what was your experience working with other nations because obviously militaries train together um other nations train together so what was your uh experience with with other nations and just any stories yeah, from that great great question um 1985 uh, med cruise um some french f8s uh came over uh from the french carrier uh, I believe it was Clemenceau at the time, maybe Foch, I can't remember. But uh, some French FAs came over to Nimitz and, and trapped aboard. So uh, a French LSO was out on the platform, you know, talking to these guys, motor, motor, instead of power. And uh, the F-8s trapped aboard, and, you know, and Nimitz had operated our F-8s, you know, when it, was, when it was new. So they, I think what I heard is they got the old, you know, aviation bosun's mates who had experience with the F-8 in the 60s and 70s, and they were able to, to hook the aircraft up to the bridle and, and shoot them off. Um, so, and I, I flew on a, on a, a, a combined force of strike with some F-8s, French F-8s in formation. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, flying low levels over Turkey and you get inter intercepted by uh, Turkish F-104s and, and Phantoms. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of low levels over, over NATO nations. Um, late in my career, uh, Israel, uh, my squadron was able to send a detachment to work with the uh, Israeli Air Force. Um, I, I didn't get to go on that one, but uh, that was pretty cool. We got to go into an Israeli, uh, you know, uh, weapons range and, and train with them. Uh, Norway, uh, I was able to, to uh, spend the night in Orland Air Base near Trondheim, Norway. Uh, just to work with the Norwegians and hey, this is what we're doing out at sea, you know, tell us what you're doing, you know, here in land. So I think, you know, all, all those things are, are terrific. And, I, and uh, uh, Bahrain, uh, that'll be the last one. We did a combined forces exercise with the, the Bahraini Air Force. Lots of air to air with those guys. And we did a, a, a practice uh, strike with them. And, and so, um, you know, we, we were pretty advanced. Uh, but they're they're flying F-16s, but you know obviously we're our our we're pretty advanced. But we we worked uh, you know some some basic stuff with those guys, and it was good. It was good that you get to know each other, and and they can get an understanding of of what you bring to the table. Um, so I think that covers it. Perfect. All right. Um, so out of. Uh... Out of all those places that you've been, uh, what would you say is is like your favorite? Um, like just in terms of scenery or, or beauty, like just flying over the the landscape. What was your favorite? Yeah, um, uh, Norway. Um, this this beautiful. And we were up there above the Arctic Circle in winter, and uh, yeah, it's just you know a blanket of snow. The the, the fjords, the mountains. Of course, the ships out there bobbing like a cork. You got to go back and land on it. the. Uh, uh, flying over Turkey, what an interesting place. I mean, you go from, you know, lush meadows to desert to, to mountains. The topography is, is amazing. Um, you know, flying over Oman, uh, Star Wars Canyon. It's, uh, you know, it's this desert with that, that uh, um, you know, you're winding through Star Wars Canyon out to the Indian Ocean. 
um, flying over Panama, uh, the jungles of Panama, and, and one memory, and this is my A7 days, uh, back when Nicaragua was a thing in the 80s. And, uh, you know, just flying over the coast of Panama, and, and I'm looking down, and I'm seeing natives in thatched huts with, with dugout canoes on the water. And it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty incredible. Um, certainly places in the United States, you know, Fallon, Nevada, El Centro, California, th those places are, are Disneyland for, for aviators, you know, the bombing ranges. And we, you know, even if we were carrying inert weapons, it's oftentimes live, you know, uh, to, to go out and, you know, two or four of us and, uh, and hit a target on time and drop those things. Um, pretty cool. So, uh, all, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's hard not to find um, a place. But I, I would say that the, the, the Mediterranean would include Tunisia and, and, and Egypt. Uh, it's, they're all different topography, but uh, pretty cool places to fly. All right. Yeah, um, I bet Norway is probably stunning. Um, just looking at pictures, it like uh, just takes my breath away. Um, for for the Brits I here, uh, I had a, had an opportunity to fly off uh, Cape Wrath, Scotland, when up, you know during my Norway times, and we would work with the Royal Air Force uh, in their weapons range there, and got to got to fly down Loch Ness, Scotland. Um, so uh, uh, you know, green. I think it was. I think it was raining. Um, but uh, a lot, just you know, just just amazing just to see that part of the world. And you know, it, it, as an American, you know, it's it's kind of where our ancestors. And I do have ancestors from Scotland and, and Ireland as well as England. Um, and just to, to see that part of the world, kind of like uh, for me anyway, where you came from. Uh, we did have um, two people join us, so uh, either Quebec or Iceman, you guys, you guys have any questions? Um, not, not really. Okay, Iceman. Okay, his uh, his mic is staying mute, so maybe he's just. Oh, there he My is. bad. My bad. I didn't hear you because I had you on mute because I was talking. Um, so what made you want to join is my question. Yeah, um, I'm a third generation naval officer, although my father and grandfather were not aviators. But I was exposed to naval aviation as a boy as we moved around the country and lived near a naval air station. And uh, as a very small boy, I, I have a memory, you know, when I grow up, I want to do this, and and I wasn't sure how at the time, but as the years went by, you know, figured out the steps to take. So so flying off aircraft carriers, I, I'm one of those guys, and there are others. That's all we ever wanted to do, and and very very fortunate that that we could. Um, so I, I was exposed to it, um, but lots of guys, you know, had okay, I, I just graduated from college, uh, maybe I'll be a Navy pilot, you know, and it's kind of kind of approach it that way and they just say uh, yeah why not give, give it a shot um so so that's that's the, the spectrum i was at one end and, and there's there's certainly another end huh all right any uh any last minute questions um i suppose we better ask carbon's question so if you were to Go back in today. Would you want to go back to flying the F eighteen, or would you want to go and fly the F sixteen, or any other um, aircraft that at the moment that's in the forces? I I would want to be a, a Navy carrier pilot, and so the the, the choices are the, uh, the the Super Hornet airframe to include the Growler, and uh, and and the F thirty five now. Uh, and, and the E2 is, is still around and, and will be for some time. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think I'd, I would be, uh, I'd be drawn to, uh, to, to naval aviation. The, the challenge of it, uh, that's, that's where the action is. In the past 20 years, it, um, really since the late 90s, 
uh, naval aviation has participated in combat in, in every year. So our our, uh, our our senior leadership are all combat experienced, and uh, it, that's um, that, that's a that's a huge advantage. Maybe the, the price to pay for that advantage is high, but it, but it is it's not nothing. And uh, so I think if if you're a young person and you want to challenge yourself and uh, and see the world and uh, and and the, the the challenge and camaraderie that I mentioned earlier, I think that carrier aviation is is the way to go. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, if no one else has any questions, um, we greatly appreciate you coming and talking to us, taking time out of your day. Um, thank, so thank you very much. From, from all of us, uh, the people who weren't here, the people who were, just want to thank you for, for joining us today and taking time out of your busy day. Well, Ninja, thanks for hosting me. It's, it's a great to see you gunslingers. Uh, tonight we ride. Have fun. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Cheers. That was a good thing. You